them jewels fast. Run them, run them jewels fast. Run them, 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 run Good night and welcome to another edition of Uncut. It's been a while, it's been a minute, as they say, but we're glad to have this show. It's Christmas week, but we're having what many are saying is the best gift of the Christmas, this particular book, Diary of a Recovering Politician. And I have the author here with me tonight, Mr. Godfrey Smith. I don't need to go through your biography. Please don't. Please don't. It will be too painful for us all. <laughs> yes. But it's a very long biography, and to make a long story short, he's a former uh, a politician, a recovering one, far from recovered, and he's also a jurist on the a former jurist on the on the bench of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, and uh, a well-known attorney here in Belize. So, welcome, Godfrey. The first thing I want to ask you is. It's a hot book. What has the reception been like so far? Well, I suppose the, the easiest answer to that is that the 250 copies that was the initial production has been sold out. So even at the launch in Belize the last night, there wasn't enough to satisfy the demand. That's not due to the Angelus Press. That's due to the inordinate demands I put on them to have the book ready in time for Christmas sales. Now, people who don't know how books sell will say 250 books does not sound like a lot. Yes. But you have written a number of books yes. and 250 was a safe starting figure. For a first day, absolutely. But it turned out not to be the case. So, so far of the four books I've written, on the first day it's easily sold the most copies. Very easily. And that has a lot to do. If we can show those other books, guys, here we have the, the lineup of the books, and we can see Diary of a Recovering Politician, George Price, Maurice Bishop, uh, Said Musa, the speeches of Said Musa, Michael Manley, and this one stands out, this new book stands out, because I would like to think it's such a damn good looking book. <laughs> And it looks good to young people. Yes. Those other books look good to old people. <laughs> yes. Um, what gave you the courage to depart from a traditional cover? A, a regular cover would be having your picture on the cover, yeah. and then, you know, my essay is like a big jerk-off book. Yeah. But um, you diverted from that. I did. As you know, the previous books had been biographies, Price, Manley, and the assassination of Morris Bishop. So you're kind of confined to something structured. This, as you've read, is a disparate range of essays. They fit into no central theme, no single theme. So I looked, I thought about something that would evoke the mood, I suppose, that reflects the space I was in when these essays was being written. And um, I thought that no better time than to... Actually, the truth is, a good friend of mine, Andrew Marshall, like, had shared some of his <laughs> daughter's uh, paintings. She's in her 20s. Correct. Very young at the uh, university in New York, I forget which, doing graphic art and so on. And from last year, he had shared some of her work, which I love the captivating surrealism of. And I then said, well, look, it's the, I should ask her to do something. And Victor, if we can show the cover, um, and I don't want to make too much of it because it's just the cover of a book, but it says a lot because the, 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 the character on the cover looks like he's stained in blood, mm. uh, returning from a battle or a campaign of some sort. We see the, the banners and the garlands on the, on the, um, on the lamp lamppost. Post. Broken bottles, tennis right. shoes. Yes. Right. So, and... This is where you find yourself after um, a life in politics. A lot of the, a lot of the essays, while they, they cover this very subject, they deal with disillusionment. We see in the book, we encounter in one of the essays, a 16-year-old handpicked by Assad Shoman and Said Musa yeah. to go to Cuba yeah. through Nicaragua. Yes. Right? This is, you were only 16 at the time. At sixth form. Right, that's six form and, and it's sworn to secrecy. Right, and and we read of your of your zeal to meet Commandante Fidel, but you fell asleep during his four-hour speech. Yes, 
can which I, was a, a, a foreboding of things to come. <laughs> can I read from that? Would you that? please read from that particular section? Uh, will you read from section where you, Mr. Musa and Mr. Schumann, are on the on the uh, on the veranda of the upstairs, the upstairs cafe, cafe, yes. With so um, Mr. Musa chomping on a cigar and Asad Shoman inhaling um, Benson and Hedges, as I recall. Yes. You have it there? Yes, I believe I do. So, so uh, may I begin? Go ahead. In 1985, a sapling, barely three weeks into sixth form, I had been selected by hometown progressives, Asad Shoman and Said Musa, in those days still branded as communists in Belize, for a clandestine trip to Cuba. My qualifications were, I suppose, that I had two brothers who were studying in Cuba and were committed socialists, and myself shown a satisfactory level of consciousness to be considered a promising young progressive. The recruitment for my first trip was at the Upstairs Café, a watering hole popular with soldiers from the British Battalion stationed in Belize, where I met the duo seated at a table on the veranda overlooking a bustling Queen Street. On a Friday afternoon, a mound of discarded peanut shells in front of them. Assaulted by smoke from the double barrels of Musa's cigar and Schumann's Benson and Hedges cigarettes, I received my instructions, excitement rising inside me, with the fumes of intrigue. Apart from immediate family, no one else was to be informed. A rum trip ticket was handed over. When I inquired as to the subject matter of the conference, I was simply told the Latin American external debt crisis. I hadn't the faintest notion what that was, but wasn't about to let that detain me. As I explored the capacious conference hall, the following day, I've jumped a few paragraphs, observing the organizational details, wondering about the mechanics of putting it all together and marveling at the number of students and youths from all over the Americas. Self-consciousness swept over me when I realized that I was rather shabbily dressed. I had nurtured the belief that would-be revolutionaries couldn't give two hoots about sartorial elegance and had shown up on this first day of conference in a raggedy pair of jeans, track shoes, and a sleeveless t-shirt. The majority of participants nattily dressed in Western style suits, their hair coiffed and slicked, left me feeling like an ingenue. The next day I switched out my t-shirt for a white short sleeve button down shirt, gathered myself and recovered a little of the confidence that had drained out of me the previous day like water rushing down a suddenly unplugged wash basin. Whoever okay. said clothes don't make the man. So in that, in, in that setting, uh, we see a young idealistic person. Yes. And, and progressively as we go through the book, as the essays develop, we see somebody increasingly um, first involved in a, in a political fantasy, yeah. right? That uh, we, we go to your meeting with uh, Ralph Fonseca and Said Musa, yes, right. So, so first you went uh, from Mr. Musa meeting Mr. Musa in the 80s mm -hmm. to now meeting Mr. Musa in the mid 90s. Yes, at that time he has progressed ideologically or regressed. His critics will argue from a, a leftist, he was a communist maybe to a socialist. And when you meet him with Fonseca, he is about to become a neoliberal. Mm -hmm. Right, to embrace those neoliberal ideals. So, um, you write... Or a pragmatic politician, one could argue. Right. I'm, I'm not sure that he embraced and considered himself a neoliberalist. I, I see him as a pragmatist. So, but anyhow, you yes. said you made a proposal, you yes. write, in September of 1996, a proposal to PUP leader Said Musa for energizing and modernizing the party. Now, at this time, Said Musa had just uh, positioned himself to, to take the place of uh, George Price, because I believe George Price, um, he got that visit, that famous visit, in August of, 1990, in August of 1996. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that the, 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 
the plans were not yet in place for Price to step down. I were not yet in place not in yet September. In place. No. So your, your plans to modernize the PUP did not include... It did not then, no. So you still envision George Price as a leader even in those plans? I don't, I'm not sure I thought about it. I just thought about a way to help the PUP to win. Yeah, well, you can't modernize but, but, it. But the dance. plans came later. Yes. So you say in this now, Fonseca gave me a quick look over yeah. and said, so you're meeting with Ralph Fonseca and Said Musa. Fonseca gave me a quick look over and said in his direct way, you look like someone who likes nice things. Yeah. Name your price. All right. Musa, with a half smile, hinted, if we form the government, you will not have to return to practicing law. Yeah. And now you say, and I don't see how this adds up, but you say, at 28, I was a neophyte, but read the subtext to mean I could be offered a seat in cabinet. I didn't read it like that. I read it to mean we are making our money, dog. No. You don't have to work again. We did, we did work from pension plan. I could easily see how you, with the passage of time, could arrive at that position. Okay. But back then, nothing of the sort existed in the minds of the young people who entered that political fray. Really? It was all rank idealism. So personal enrichment, you did not see an invitation to personal enrichment? Absolutely not. But you, 26 years old. This is You were 28. 28. First meeting, I'm not sure, but whatever. 1996, you were 28. First meeting with the two biggest <coughs> political power brokers in the People's United Party. Completely overwhelming. I should say, however, that since writing that, Mr. Fonseca has texted me to express the view that I have been unfair to him. Okay. He has a different view of how that conversation went. And if, if I may refer to I it, would love to hear and what And just said. for the benefit of our viewers, I did ask his permission if right. I could read out on the show what he said. So he said, from the first paragraph, you seem to forget that you told me that you are the type of person that when you see a stereo that you like, you want it now when you have extra cash to buy it. That is why I said you are a practical person and tried to give you what you wanted. My response to him is, ha ha. I said, no such thing. But as I said, historical events will be interpreted in many different ways. No, I'm not here to defend my position, but I was a practicing lawyer. Right. I could buy... A stereo. <laughs> I could buy well, a stereo. Mr. Fonseca recalls you saying, why, when I say a stereo, I, I want to buy it. So I, mean, I can't imagine where he got that from, but he's entitled to his recollection right. of history. It doesn't make any sense, because even after I got the job, it wasn't that I was paid more than being a lawyer, and I never bought a stereo. But both his and I interpretation see the same thing. Yes. We both see that that enrichment, yes. that access to material resources, because they were talking to you. We see you now, but they were talking to you as a, as a, a, a boy not of means, a young man yeah. not of means. Yes, you were a trained attorney, but you I, were not I, raised in any privileged background or environment. All. None at all. Yeah. Right? You came from a, a single parent home that is off correct. Hyde's Lane. Correct. So, what he is saying and what I am reading is they're both putting a, a mountain of treasure in front of you. No, they didn't. I have to say. <coughs> they didn't. You didn't see it like that. I didn't see it like that. And I can say it not only for myself, but for the people who entered. I never forget somebody saying to one of my friends, I, I shan't call any names, but you're familiar with the players. Somebody called Dean Barrow, who was then in government, and said, the thing is, these young people really believe in what we're saying. And we did. You really believe? We really believe that there was the greatest opportunity for wholesale change. So, gradually the scales were lifted from before your eyes. <laughs> you write in there. There I was at the, at the heart of the government making policy with nothing to distinguish me, except perhaps youthful energy, determination, and an appetite for reform. Yeah. I would sometimes catch myself thinking, usually when some absurd policy was being discussed in the cabinet, yeah. we are the people running this entire country. Yes. And you're there and there's not a sense of seriousness. 
So you would say that when you, you got into government, you realize quickly this Musa administration, from your conception of it, man, no, 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 serious. The essence of it, I think, was lack of planning. Right. I had the naive view that as we're seated around the, the big table, as I like to call it, the biggest boardroom of the country, and you're running the country. So there has to be some order and organization. As a minister, you can't just be pushing ridiculous papers and ideas. There has to be some central plan where each minister is told, I want to see your plan of action. I want to see what your five-year plan, five plan is. I want to see how you're going to implement it. These are our priorities. This is how we're going to budget for this. But none of that happened. So any whole week, you open your, your sheaf of cabinet papers, and there are all manner of random things, not following any order, not following any logic, not following any list of priorities. You see, in retrospect, being in cabinet was underwhelming. Yeah. To call it anticlimactic would be an insult to climaxes. Yes, uh, and I mean that, and I don't even, it may be true up to now, but you'd right. have to ask Dean Barrow and the new Prime Minister, John Brissett. Well, I couldn't get a straight it, what, answer out of them. What, what I would have like? to ask their, <laughs> their, their, uh, their ministers. Yeah. But you write, um, you say in the book that, that um, you actually, in speaking about what happened in the cabinet, you said that you tried to organize the Musa cabinet. You tried to create an atmosphere where, okay, you and bring so-and-so paper, and we'll do it in an organized way. Yes. But you're saying that the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Musa, never took that seriously. He just basically said, all right, sounds good, and now that not happen. Well, yeah, just to give a little bit more of detail to that, I was Attorney General, and so there were many times when ministers would ask us to draft legislation supported by a cabinet paper, supporting a, a, a particular policy decision, but there had been no previous cabinet dis discussion about it. So after slaving away and preparing all of this, it would go to cabinet, cabinet would review it and say, but we're not ready for this or it doesn't make any sense. And so I brought a paper demonstrating the wasted hours and that it made no sense. But, but that never changed, really. And you write in there, when you were finished making this presentation, you received blank stares. Yes. I... Not a single word was uttered. We simply moved on to the next item on the agenda. The reason why <clears throat> people have asked, do you keep a memoir or a diary? I don't. But the reason why is that I'd put so much effort into this, I thought it made perfect sense. I could never forget the blank expressions. It's like I've said nothing at nothing. all. And you just moved on to so the other So how do you people. explain that? Because you say, why people have an interest in this book, why it has outsold their expectation, is because people are trying to decode what happens in politics because it controls so much of our national life and energy. Yeah. And nobody understands why they man act like this? Like, why, why they go on? So, so people think they, they, they have in this a key, at least, to start understanding yeah. the psychology of a cabinet minister. Yeah. The psychology of a cabinet minister is simply, and of course, I risk generalizing here, but you get there and you know it all. This has been my experience. So I would see technocrats being brought in. People like to say, um, well... There are many talented people in Belize. There are many technically skilled and gifted people in Belize. I've sat in many cabinet meetings where technical people are brought in. They're, they're, they explain why things have to go a certain way, the local implications, regional, international implications, and how it overlaps with other things. And they're dismissed because it's simply not politically convenient. And so I suppose it's a systemic problem in a way in that all politicians are concerned with is winning again and staying in power. So it doesn't matter how gifted a technician you may be or a, a, a public officer, what trumps is political expediency, which you know as, as well as I. Yes, okay, but so, so what, you, what you also say is that... Um, you speak about campaign financing, you speak about 
about um, ministers developing a war chest. This is a major part of being in the cabinet and surviving politically. You write in the book, you had to go ask Mr. Ashcroft to help you for houses for a constituency. Yes. Two houses in your pick stock constituency. It might have been more, but yes, yes. So I think the most disappointing thing was that I, th I thought when we entered, because we had been such a formidable opposition, so unified, so efficient, so l like a machine working together. And immediately upon assuming government, it fell apart. I thought this would be a thing where you sit around the table, each representative is asked, hey, what are your priorities? What do you need to win? Let us help you to win. But it, nobody did that. Nobody did that. You, you were on your own, basically. You write that little of the camaraderie we enjoyed in opposition survived in government. Yeah. Those were halcyon days. The party had harnessed the best and brightest ever in history. Yeah. And we worked efficiently as a team, fully, uh, full of conviction, strategizing, campaigning. This is during the campaign. Yes. Relentlessly attacking, always in rapid response. That dissipated soon after we won. Ministers jealously guarded turf. Any gravy for social assistance available in a ministry tended to be piped exclusively to one's own constituents. Constituency. I skip down to the next paragraph. You write the ceaseless machinations, the policy of divide and rule created a fractured cabinet racked by mistrust, resentment, and eventually hatred, leading to entropy and finally the party's defeat after two terms. Whoa! But you serious, man? But you know this. Yeah. I, I lived in it. Yeah. That's but, how it works. Um, I think what was missing is central command and control. Okay. Where somebody has to take charge and say, listen, we're a team. I will respect individual talents and abilities, and you can't all move at the same level. But there has to be some, some force that balances things and makes people feel involved. And I think, unfortunately, that was missing. And you write wrong. that a big part of the problem, as you perceived it, was Mr. Fonseca. We've heard uh, some of his remarks earlier, but you said that Mr. Musa, devoid of hubris and arrogance, he tried to please everyone, was never heavy-handed and a consensus builder. Yeah. Fonseca, on the other hand, you write, his stock in trade was intimidation and fear. Yeah. Opposing his reckless financial management meant being cut off from financing for a constituency project. You speak about when he came into cabinet speaking finance. I usually had no idea. You're a cabinet minister. You're the attorney general yeah. or minister of foreign affairs. I usually had no idea what he was talking about and was too intimidated to ask. Yeah. So was everyone else. We bitched behind his back, but were like docile schoolboys in cabinet. Yeah. The tag team of Musa's creamy charm and Fonseca's vengeful, vengeful wrath meant that on the surface, cabinet deliberations were calm, but fellas fumed and fulminated outside. Yeah. What one sees developing is increasingly an atmosphere of seething resentment in the cabinet. Yeah, I think that's how it began, actually. You've put your finger on it. The demise of the PUP, that formidable machine that won so magnificently in 98, it came down to seething resentment at the inequality, lack of balance, and the enormous... Uh, power vested in one man. I think that was the beginning of it. And, uh, you know, I, I, in, that, in that essay, you go on to explain that Mr. Musa's uh, um, loyalty to Mr. Fonseca and, and really his, his uh, alliance, they were a tag team, you described them, really led, you believe, to the undoing of the PUP. Um, you write that, you know, with, um, with three and a half years to go in office, um, you write in a very compelling way that the, the, the PUP was, um, we had lost the confidence of the people in a wilderness of lies and deception. Yes. Yes. You helped expose a lot of those things. Um, that was the truth. But what the essay does not address is, yes, it addressed the internal tensions but what it does not address is that as i perceived it at the time the pup was an enterprise mm. since then 
I have seen the UDP, 2008 to 2020, many of the players operated as an enterprise, mm. but the, the, the PUP from 98 to 2008, or at least to 2005 when G7 happened, seemed to be operated from the top as an enterprise. That from the top, there was always a consideration that man have to make our money. Would you accept that the wilderness of lies and deception that, that it ended up in was, yes, fueled by that resentment, but what really created it is that no one was serious about running the country or putting the country in a better position. Yes. Yes, that's true. So now looking at it retrospectively, you were disillusioned and, and uh, you, you, know, you, you bought it completely. At what point did you say, okay, this is what's going on. I have to figure out my place in this matrix. Yeah. Because it's sink or swim. Yeah. You say, you, you, write, you write in here, if you had a lean ministry, you had to wait to see the Minister of Finance and prostrate yourself before him. Ministers who had been in government before and knew the game filled their war chest yeah. and looked after their constituencies. This is what people out there are trying to understand. That so what does filling your war chest mean? It means making deals. Yes, and using government resources where you can, um, fixing it up in as legitimate a way as you can to fill your war chest. It doesn't happen only in Belize, it happens everywhere throughout the Caribbean. So yes, you use state resources to finance projects. Now, as we, as we finish our, our discussion about this particular chapter, which is, and I know the chapter that will excite um, much of the, the, um, the public's attention, um, what would you say, obviously, you know, whenever you look back at something that failed, you say, what could I could have been done differently? Not you, but what could have been done differently? But when I read this, what I conclude is that in order to do this in a different way, the entire personalities at the top would have to change. Or, as occurred in the G7, and you, we might have to talk a bit more that on in a later segment, people were disappointed nationally when the G7 returned back to cabinet. They were utterly disappointed. Right. They preferred us to commit seppuku and not go back and for the first time make a stand for reform. But we went back in. And so to answer your question, I think if we had remained outside, it may perhaps have, have been a trigger to, to make some fundamental change or perhaps begin a new direction with a new party. My feeling at the time was that you all did not remain outside because if you remain outside, you will become marginalized to an extent that you will lose all your power. Yeah. And you will lose the cover of the mass party yes. as well. And most of us didn't really want the party to lose. We were a member of George Price's party. We wanted to win. We perceived there was a problem and we tried to contain and deal with that problem, but ultimately failed. You're going to have to ask me at some point about what was my role. There were those who said I was a double agent, so please yeah. free to ask me about that. No, I, I'm happy to ask you no. Yeah. Um, you are a principal part of the G7. Let's go through the names. Let's see who can remember. <laughs> Jose Koye, I mentioned him first because he publicly, I believe, threw the first blow. Yeah. Um, Marcus Pat, Cordell High, John Brissenia was the most are you senior person. Them numbered? Yeah. So Jose Joe Koye, Marcus Pat, Cordell, Cordell Hyde. Hyde. Servolo Baeza. Hold on, we have mentioned John Bresenio, yeah. who was away in Chicago, I yes. recall. He had to come in. Eamon Courtney. Yes. Servolo Baeza. And Godfrey Smith. Yes, that's the seven. So that's seven. Yeah. You write about the G7 in here, not in sufficient depth. I hope that in time, yeah. we'll have a long, a long form on it. But that G7, historically, is the most important uh, uh, um, 
cabinet revolt we've ever seen in Belize. In the history of the country, right. yeah. But a lot of people said that you were working with the Musa, mm -hmm. you were working covertly with Said Musa, yeah. and uh, sort of snitching on the, on the other members of the G7. Yeah. Your response to that? So here comes the truth. You are right. My recollection is that Joe Koi was the person who approached me. And you have to re recall that there had been several forays before. There was a gang of four, I think myself, Henry Canton, Marcus Pat and Amon, or some such configuration right. to deal with what we perceived as this problem in, in, in the party. So there have been several of those. So when Joe came to me and explained the position, the first thing I did was try to get a sense of how serious it was and who was involved. This had to be July or... I think it must have been... 2004. Yes, it was 2004. It happened in August, so it might have been late July. Yeah. And I gauged that, yes, they were serious. And I called a meeting with my closest people, including my brother and my then-law partner, Fred Lumore, and said, look, I have to make a decision. This thing could bring down the government. It could end political careers. And their position was, you have to be on the side of the angels. So I made my decision. Now here where it's become murky. I immediately called Assad Schumann, who was ambassador in Cuba, I believed. Yes. Assad, as you know, is Said's conscience and perhaps his closest friend. And I had always had a long relationship and a good relationship with Assad. We he were was your mentor. Good. He was my mentor indeed. So I called him and said, we have a problem. Your friend is in trouble. He said, how serious is it? I said, it's very serious. He said, is it a palace coup? I said, no, we're not after the king's head. We're after Fonseca's head. And I said, you'd better come. So he came. No, the part about being a double agent is this. During the seven days that unfolded, there were several conversations between Assad and myself. I did not reveal this to my colleagues, the seven, but we'll get to the nature of what the conversations were. But you can't be immature about it. In crisis, in huge crisis, whether it's the Cuban myth or whatever, everybody is talking around to find a solution. Joe Koy, for instance, was talking to Billy Musa who sat on the right hand of side with Yasser on the left in every meeting we had with them. Right. What was the purpose of the discussion? To figure out how we could bring this thing to a resolution. Right. So I was talking to Assad too. He would say to me, and bear in mind, how could I be a traitor to my side if Schumann was on our side? Schumann, Schumann wasn't in favor of the status quo. Right. He wanted to preserve his friend as prime minister. But he's a reformer, the greatest among us. So he wanted what we wanted. He was trying to find a way to broker a resolution to get us back, save his friend as king, and remove the problem. And so he'd say, could this work, could that work? He'd tell me what the problem was on their side, that they're about to try to destroy all of us, that Price said, we must excise them all. <laughs> it was that kind of thing that was, it wasn't that it was a chess game and I was revealing trade secrets. Okay. But that's how it came about. Said Musa called me a particular night. At the time I lived in Belmapan. I never forgot picking up the phone uh, at some point in the night and he said, Godfrey, you have to decide what you're going to do because we're going to fire the whole lot of you. You need to come over. And I said, I'm sorry, that's not my position. But of course, the tactic was to try to weaken us by having yeah. people removed. So yes, I was talking to Schumann. I spoke to nobody else. I had that one conversation with Said. I did not want to destroy the party I didn't create. I didn't feel it was up to me. But coming out of it, yes. when, when you all came back into the fold, yes. you were empowered with the, with the most powerful ministry, my perception, and the ministry where one could accumulate the biggest war chest, the Ministry of Tourism. So I was stripped of Attorney General. Right. I was stripped of Minister of Defense. 
And but I, I don't think that tourism thing came immediately after. I, I can't remember if it did. Because Mark and Cordell were brought back in, but, but Mark at some point they kept pressing and resisting and right. rebelling. Yeah. But yes, I was I was um, You got an upgrade out of it, Godfrey? I, I don't know if I'd call the BTB in, 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 is the chunkiest war chest in is. political history. It is. And I used it to my advantage. I learned from my predecessor. Fair enough. Yeah. So, I, so that's what fuels the interpretation that you, you may play against because when it came no, out... But I had no notion at the time that this is how it would play out. This wasn't some pre-prepared script. All the people who were in the G7 to the greatest extent, I thought, really just wanted a solution for the party to win. Nobody was planning to say, well, this is how I'm going to benefit afterwards. That just, how, that just wasn't how it was. But I can see how that interpretation can be put on it. Now, and we'll end this here, but this, this same essay finds you back now at the, at the apex of the decision making when the Musa administration in 2005-2006 is plunged into its deepest crisis. Yeah. I think it was the universal debt at the time. Yeah. The apex of decision making, you are in the inner circle. And you, Francis Fonseca, right. Said Musa and Ralph Fonseca have to make the pivotal decision on whether the government should go through with paying off the universal debt or not. So, again, we see you, although you had, had been a part of G7, you re-emerged as Mr. Musa's closest ally, or among his closest allies and trusted advisors. Not closer than Mr. Fonseca, I could never say that. But, so then, how, how is this? That the scales were lifted bef from before your eyes, and then the next thing you know, you the right in there, put some more scales from my eyes. Because there is no mystery to it. Either you, you can't change the system. This is how I, this is my thought processes then. Either you step away forever, as I have done now, or you attempt to change the system from within. So as dire as the straits were that we were in, you have to recall that I had won the most votes twice in deputy leader convention. More than John Bresenio. And I thought I was working sufficiently hard in my constituency to withstand the tsunami that we all knew were coming, which would position me for leadership. I miscalculated badly, fatally, as it turned out, the immense work I thought I did was, was simply not sufficient to withstand the tidal wave that, that raged over us <laughs> during that time. We'll take a break now. I just want to add one <laughs> tiny and delicious anecdote from the book. Uh, when when, when um, the opposition was outside, breaking up the concrete steps yeah. leading to Parliament and hurling large chunks of cement against the door of the Parliament, you write, Quote, inside we could hear the projectiles crashing against the door and smell the fumes from the tear gas. This is the best line now. Ainsley Leslie, an MP from the west of the country, God rest the dead, nervously flashed me his 9mm pistol, indicating he was ready for anything. But he looked terrified. terrified. You're right. <laughs> yes, I remember. I remember it clearly. So, bro, let's show you now and say, I'm ready for anything, but I'm ready for wrong. Terrified. I think he was peeing himself at the, at the time. Serious days. We'll take our first commercial break, folks. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll talk about the man, the man personal friend, the billionaire who befriended him, Michael A. Ashcroft. He'll talk about his time on that jet. He'll explain in detail how the leather interior of Mr. Ashcroft's jet feel. <laughs> so... Stay tuned for that <laughs> when we come back after our first commercial break. Run them jewels fast, run them, run them jewels fast, run them, 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 run
Welcome back to Uncut. We are here with Godfrey Smith, the author of the newly released and done sell out book, Confessions of a, sorry, Diary of a Recovering Politician. It was released on Monday in Belmopan. And guys, we can bring up the pictures of the um, launches. And it was, uh, it was uh, released in the city last night and it was to, it was wrong pictures, guys. It was to rave reviews. Um, it was to it was to rave reviews, and I would like to to speak about those launches and the and the books themselves. Um, in terms of what we are seeing here is Mike Perfit, uh, another picture which is Shine Barrow. This is the Prime Minister. This is the one in Belmopan with the Prime Minister, Mr. Godfrey Smith. You are the darling of the establishment. The political establishment, if we can continue the pictures, guys, the darling of the establishment, you and the prime minister, this is the same prime minister who you, uh, he was leader of the opposition then, when you wrote most unkind things about him um, in your in your flashpoint, uh, your column at the time, you mocked him. But there he is now, Mike Perfit, one of your biggest fans. And um, I know Shine Barrow was here too, at, at the one in the city. I am saying that, for a book, you, you, you fashion yourself in the book one reads as anti-establishment. Anti but you are the darling of the establishment. Explain this contradiction. Well, I don't know that I'm the darling of the establishment. Um, I only see the glitterati at your book launching, uh, sir. I, for instance, <laughs> with this government, I take cases against the government and I act for the government. But look, at this stage of my life, having been through politics, I, the idea is to make yourself of service to whoever is willing to accept your service and advice. And for the sake of the country, I mean, I've, I'm out of politics, never mind the recovering politician, but there's no going back to that. And the country is too small and too divided. I'm right now in Guyana doing a commission of inquiry in a, in a society that is immensely divided. How can anything good come of that? So I think we have to move to a stage where that bitterness, that tribalism uh, bleeds out and there's more room for cross-party collaboration. So I, I you write it, in the book yeah. that people will always see you are, are um, one of the the problems in society is that you will always be seen as a PUP. Um, you, you, you wrote in the book. Right. I'm trying to find the exact... Um, I think it's towards the end of the billionaire chapter. Right. Yeah. Um, that, that you will always be perceived. Um, see, here we found it. Um, in a small society like Belize with a population of 400,000, one's past associations are worn like a scarlet letter, you write. No matter how distant from party politics I try to be, I am branded for life as a PUP. Yes. That's no surprise. I mean, you, yeah, I, I will wear that letter forever, I imagine. But, but you, you are saying now that you no longer associate with the PUP. No, I do, but not in a party political way. I have many friends in the People's United Party. I am not involved at this stage with any governmental policy decision. There was one issue I approached them on and offered my services as, as a sort of honest broker mediator, which was in relation to indigenous rights issue for the Maya people down south, for which I have a strong position. I think that's well known. It didn't get very far. You failed. I, I, I failed. <laughs> I failed. Um, you're the second person that has said that. Asad Schumann put it as emphatically as you did. Because I went in with enthusiasm saying, no, I think we can, we can reach these guys. We can, good sense can prevail. We can talk in terms of legacy, what needs to be done. But no, I failed outright in that this is a long road, though, the, the issue of indigenous rights.
Well, it's, it's been seven term. years and we can't implement that, the judgment that's yet. That's short compared to what happens globally. But where, well, it's, a, it's another matter that deals with the, the rule of law, no? But yeah. I want to speak now a little about the book. Yeah. Um, because it's quite a, a, an accomplishment for those of us who've, um, who followed the other books, which were by Ian Randall Publishers. Yes. Um, the, if looking at this, the quality of this book, which you self-published. Yes. The quality of this book is as higher, higher than those books. The, the uh, typeset, the binding, it's, it's a well-made book. Speak about the, how you made this book and why you decided to self-publish. Um, well, the writing part you know about. But after the writing comes a publishing house. Right. I took a pain out, page out of Shine Barrow's playbook who is always promoting local and trying to push local players, producers, whatever it may be. And I decided to try the Angelus Press. Now the problem, the tricky bit was Angelus Press is a printing house. It's not a publishing house. So a publishing house will have editors either in-house or farm it out who deal with editing, scrubbing down, replacing paragraphs, fighting it out with the author to bring that scalpel to cut out and excise stuff, putting the correct name, tech, uh, formatting, typesetting, all sorts of things. Angelus Press doesn't do that. They're a great printing house. So I had to find somebody who could do that. And I found it in the person of Amanda Ramirez. I, I don't know if you have a... We have a photo of Amanda yeah. out there, guys. There. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. And she actually is not a publisher. I don't think she's ever published anything before, but it's a testament to her gifts, her talents, her analytical abilities and skills that she was able to put together what you saw there in terms of getting it ready for printing. And as you say, um, the printing team at the Angelus Press, led by Jermaine Sanchez, I think we have Jermaine, yeah. That's okay. Jermaine and Loretta and Lyndon Balderamos. And they put together the book in, in record time, really. So going forward, you will not... Ian Randall Publishers is a preeminent publishing house in, in the, the Caribbean. Caribbean. That is correct. But going forward... You don't see yourself going back to Randall? No, I, I see working with Angelus Press and improving even more, moving to the level of maybe hardback editions, a little more flexibility. I mean, when you flip a cover, you know, it should, it should flip back. It shouldn't okay. stay up. I mean, these are minor things, yeah. but, but when you want to operate at the international level, it, it, it makes a difference. Um, but definitely... As you said, an elegant, handsome production. And yes, I, I would encourage people to, to work with the Angelus Press. And of course, Anya Marshalek, I don't know you have, if you have a... She was on your Sun Up show, right. is responsible for the cover, as you've, right. as you've pointed out before, which has attracted a lot of young people. I know this because my daughter and her friends have an interest in the book. They had absolutely no interest in Price, Manley and Bishop just because of the cover. So a word to young writers or would-be writers, the cover makes all the difference right. in the world. And if you had put on a masturbatory cover of yourself looking intelligent, nobody would have buy that. <laughs> nobody. nobody cares. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So now, uh, if we can jump to Mr. Ashcroft, the billionaire who be befriended me. Yeah, the first essay in the book. The first essay in the book, the lead essay, obviously yes. trying to to court international attention. Absolutely. Right? Um, and now you know that, that whenever we hear that, uh, and I would like you to read a section of it the, the, when you go on Mr. Ashcroft's private jet. Yeah. Not, not many Belizeans have gone. We learn in the book that Mr. Musa uh, accompanied you all back from, from one Manila. of the international conferences. So yes. he has gone on that jet as well. Yes. But read if you can the... The section about uh, um, getting strapped in on that jet <laughs> on board the, the Salt Falcon 900. I will let you read it because I may vomit. <laughs> so, 
So it begins, um, this is on being invited on trips with him. Of course, it offered a glimpse into celebrity lifestyle. No need for tiresome checking at airports or immigration and customs queues. You relaxed in a VIP lounge while documents are processed with lightning speed and you are set for takeoff shortly after arrival at the airport. On board the Dassault Falcon 900, I was in the lap of luxury. Before I could nestle into the supple leather seats, I was asked by a young and attractive stewardess, blonde of course, whether I would like anything before we took off. I remember asking for something complex to test the bar's range. Off she sashayed across the deep pile carpet to the galley, stocked with gastronomic delights to guarantee a fine dining experience at 45,000 feet in the air. I surveyed the glistening veneer, swiveled my chair and tested if it could recline into a bed. It did, remembering the, the amused look on James Bond's face as he made himself comfortable aboard Goldfinger's private jet. I laughed to myself at the unreality of it. There I was, a nobody from Belize, an imposter playing big in the white man's world. I, it, um, I, 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 earlier today, I sent that section to you and asked if you could read it because I, I consider it one of the most revealing sections in the book because in this book we find a, a, a restless spirit constantly searching, searching for that thing. But you also feel yourself at many points an imposter that you don't belong here. Well, obviously, I mean, what am I doing on a private jet? I, I didn't belong there. It was... Um, a matter of convenience, because I was Minister of Foreign Affairs, I offered him an entree into global politics, which fascinated him then and still fascinates him now. And he offered the opportunity to get a glimpse into the lifestyle and habits and behavior of a billionaire, which for anybody with intellectual curiosity must be of some interest. It's not every day that you get to examine a billionaire up close. It's interesting to me. I make no apologies for that. So, um, you know, you, you speak at length about um, the various conferences you, you went to with Mr. Ashcroft, and it's, it's quite numerous. Um, we knew about a couple. We reported one time you, you hop on plane from Malaga, Spain. Yeah, yeah. At the time, that, that was a scandal because, um, you know, so many governments have been pitched in dispute with Mr. Ashcroft, as was yours, and there you were beside him on a jet. But, um, you know, about your, your relationship with Mr. Ashcroft, you say you will forever, you write, I will forever be regarded as an acolyte of Ashcroft. Mm -hmm. To some, this is viewed as a mark of distinction, to others, a mark of disgrace. Yeah. Indeed, many Belizeans reading this chapter will say that you don't want to vend the patria. You don't want to sell out yeah. because Mr. Ashcroft has done so many things that are against the national interest. Yeah. But you write in here that he has only really been facilitated. He has taken the deals that politicians have given him. Yes. Um, I recognize that my position is in the slimmest of minorities. That it most, may be a position of one. But, 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 but more, no, I, I think I met somebody at the book launch actually in Belmopan who said, I'm glad to see that your position reflects mine. I shall call no names in relation to Michael Ashcroft. Okay. Um, but yes, politicians were falling over themselves to get campaign finance from him. Um, you invite an ultra capitalist. You invite a predator, a shark, into a pond of rockfish or snooks, and you try to fight him or do things to him, he will react as a shark does. He didn't come to Belize on his own and get involved with politicians. He was invited in. So he was enabled and um, the politicians made deals with him. 
And when they tried to, to turn on him, they felt his wrath. Now, you write in here that you believe he gave the PUP $1 million in their uh, 1998 campaign. And the UDP as well afterwards. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll reach there. But $1 million does not sound like a lot of money. Today, it doesn't. But remember, we're talking about 1998. I mean, with each general election, the costs skyrocket. Right. The amount of money you're talking about. Right. You know, and I remember talking to other Caribbean politicians and being startled by the fact that the sums I was talking about in Belize was more than they were accustomed to getting. I think I make the point in the book that it's a part of culture now. I, I, but, but, but as well, Australia got a million pounds yes. or something, and that was the biggest ever in Australia's history at the time. So no, don't don't thumb your nose at the the one million Belize at the time it was. If I could read that section, yeah. uh, very quickly, that um, he had pumped it right. You write of Mr. Ashcroft, he had pumped one million dollars into the PUP to ensure the defeat of the UDP government, which had been trying to dismantle the 30-year tax concession granted to his public investment company in 1990. Yes. As an aside, you write, his donation of one million to the Liberal Party in September 2004 was at the time the biggest single private donation in Australian political history. Right. So Australia is a developed country. Yeah. And I am here laughing at a million dollars. Yes. Because a million dollars, I know man say, in a, the last election in 2015, then bond $500,000 in a day. Well, I mean, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but yeah. <laughs> you mean one politician? One constituency. Well, I'm not so sure. There's a lot of graft in there. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. I, my, my instincts might be off, but it sounds like a lot. It sounds like a lot. Yeah. But your figure sounds like a little, but yeah. as you said, within the context of Australia, yeah. it's, it's yeah. um Well, I mean, still bear in mind that there's, I imagine, campaign regulations, finance regulations. So you can't be dropping those huge sums. Right. You have to find other ways of doing it. But in Belize, there's no regulation. So, I mean, you can... Right. Yeah. But that's, that's loose money. Yone Rosado said he gave 50000 He didn't even buy the benefit of a phone call if you say, boy, with a confident vehicle, then just go on and take it. 50,000 is nothing. Yeah. 50,000 doesn't even get you in the door. Yeah. So, but it's, it's rare when people talk about numbers, so we have yeah. seas on it. But if we, could, if we could trace back the origin of your relationship with Mike Lashcroft, yeah. it began, he wanted to use your suit. He needed a suit. He, you were in Havana. Yes. This was the, the Moose administration's junket. Yes. Would you like me to... Please read. Let me see. Uh, when Mr. Can... Ashcroft <laughs> needed a suit. From... Uh, it's uh, on my one, it's page 9, but it may be page 11 in... All right, Shadow let's Park. see. Um, so very quickly... No, 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 it's not 9, so... I, I, yeah. Um, so we, we were on a junket to Cuba. I say, he did not fly with us on the Cubana flight, generously laid on by Fidel Castro, but cruised into the Marina Hemingway port aboard his posh 45-meter super yacht, the Atlantic Goose. He, as I was later to observe, paid scant regard to sartorial and societal niceties, at least on this side of the Atlantic, and tended to be a casual dresser, an outsider to the pinstripe generation, he had turned up in Cuba without a suit, which was a requirement for meeting the, com the commander-in-chief the following day. It was Ralph Fonseca, Belize's de facto minister of finance, who knocked on my door to ask if, by chance, I had brought an extra suit on the trip. Fonseca was the party's campaign manager, treasurer, problem solver, enforcer, longtime ally of Ashcroft, an interface between the billionaire and the government. He explained that I had about the same height and structure as Ashcroft, so most likely my suit would fit him. As it turned out, I did bring an extra one. I quickly ran the lint remover over it and handed it over. That evening at the state reception at the Palacio de la Revolución, I met Michael Ashcroft for the first time. He was in full flight, working the room, delivering punchlines and trading witticisms. He thanked me warmly, saying he wouldn't forget my kind gesture and promised to return the suit at some point, which he did. So now, yeah, so it starts out, uh, 
it starts out uh, innocently enough. Yes. Right? Totally. And he did return your suit. He did. Um, but then at that point, um, you were running in pick stock. You wanted to run in pick stock, yes. which was the, the fiefdom of the, it was perceived as the fiefdom of Mr. Price and the ushers. Right. You know, Mr. Price had retired from, from politics, but it was his constituency from 1989 mm -hmm. up until that point. Right. You were an outsider, a nobody. Right. One poor boy from Hyde's Lane. Correct. And you ran on that, what they said was a racist, uh, um, was a racist campaign slogan. Vote right. for Godfrey, he na wanna Godfrey wee. Godfrey wanna wee, yes. Godfrey da wanna wee. Yeah. But the Musa Fonseca tandem resisted your candidacy. Yes. Explain. Not because they disliked me or against me, but because of the family alliances and so on. Um, my, the, the, my opponent was the great George Price's nephew. His mother was Jane Usher, an icon, the CEO of one of the most powerful financial institutions, who had herself never lost that seat and had handed it over to her brother, who had lost, George, who had lost the election in 84. So you ran into political entitlement? Yes, I ran into political entitlement and a dynasty, in effect. And so at that point, I had to call in my chips when I was told that the forces would be unleashed against me. I mean, look, I was offered other divisions. Yeah. Why don't you run in Colette? Why don't you do this? How can we get you to back away? I didn't, because obviously, if one wants a political career, stepping in the shoes of the great man's, of the great man price, obviously has historical, massive historical significance. And I had already tested the waters and found that the campaign had resonance, so I did not back down. But I had to then call in my chips with Michael Ashcroft. You say that, uh, I, I don't know if you want to read it, he yes. readily agreed to see me aboard his yacht. Do yeah. you have that one? That would be um, on yes. this electronic one, it's page 14. Yeah, so I said, um, the word was sent forth that I was a pariah in relation to pick stock. At this juncture, it was shit or bust. So I decided to cash my coupon with Michael Ashcroft, now Lord Ashcroft of Chichester. He readily agreed to see me aboard his yacht anchored in the Belize City Harbor. His relations with Musa and Fonseca had been souring over BTL. And then I talk a little bit more about that. And I say a motorized dinghy picked me up at the pair of the Ashcroft-owned Radisson Fort George Hotel, and we sped off on a three-minute ride across the harbor to the Atlantic Goose. A crewman instructed me to take off my shoes before stepping onto the high-gloss wooden floor of the living room located at the ship's stern. He had a bad air, so he asked me to sit on the right side of his good air. He took devilish delight in my story and laughed. Our conversations would be punctuated with humor, often of the risque kind, but in business mode, he would become absolutely serious, his eyes riveted on you with unblinking, hawk-like focus, listening keenly. He agreed to finance my campaign, not because I could assist him in his telecommunications battle. I couldn't. That was way above my pay grade, and he knew that. It was more, I think, to be an irritant to the Troika. There was no quid pro quo. Besides, for him, the donation was pocket change. I figured it roughly equated to filling the tank of his private jet, which by my calculation, burnt fuel at the rate of United States $1,000 per hour. I was more than happy to enter this Faustian pact. Don't F up, he said with uproarious laughter as I headed back across the harbor, and I didn't. Okay, so we see the, the, the genesis there of your relationship with Mr. Ashcroft, yeah. which um, so many would come to know him as a financier. But you all developed a special friendship, but I, I want to go back to the part you, you jumped over for, just for your own economy. Um, but you say here that Musa and Fonseca had been souring over a lucrative, exclusive telecoms license held by BTL in which his companies were majority shareholders. 
they, they Musa and Fonseca, had sent him a clear message that when that exclusive license expired in 2003, it would not be renewed without a quid pro quo. Yeah. What was that quid pro quo? Well, as he puts it, a, a pension for the boys, that there had to be something in it for them. I wasn't privy to that conversation. I'm only going by what he said. And w we want to stress that is, is what Mr. Ashcroft said. We do not have any proof of that. And I, I'm sure Mr. Fonseca or may have adverted to it also in, in um, his, well, well, um, his text message. Yes, let, let's, to be fair, as I said to you and the audience, um, he, let me see if I can find that, texted me saying that some of the stuff was very unfair. Right. And um, he said, I was trapped as campaign manager um, from 1997, from 1987 this is until, Mr. Yes, until 2008. And also minister trying to please everyone as best and as properly as possible. He says an enterprise with uh, Glenn Godfrey side and myself, both Glenn Godfrey and Michael Ashcroft were pissed at us. Neither one speaks to us up to today. We had to do the right thing. We raised hundreds of millions and built thousands of houses across Belize. And you know that. The problem was a mismatch between the new mortgages and the term of the, sec the securitized bonds. That's why we tried to create a soft landing by raising 250 million to bridge the gap, etc., cetera, et cetera. Yes. Balls in the air, baby. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so uh, we hear Mr. Fonseca's part. Indeed, he says they were just trying to walk in the middle and they lost um, their alliances and friendship. But Mr. Mr. Ashcroft was convinced and he testified in court. Uh, he did an affidavit yeah. that says he very, very believes he was a part of a sting that, mm. that they were trying to, to run a political... Uh, game. So he swore to that. And Mr. Ashcroft, you say it in here, and I will say it, I've said it all the time, is not a man known for speaking falsehoods. No, and you know, that's one of the things that I liked and still like about him. For a man who has no need to impress me or to be truthful to me, I have always found him to be unstintingly honest, straightforward, direct about any question I had for him. And he explained it by saying, look, at the level at which I operate, where there has to be transparency on the stock exchange and so on, and you can be sued and be, be drawn into all sorts of lawsuits, he has to be transparent about the things that he does. Um, so, yes, I always found him to be direct and straightforward. If I can, if I can uh, re read your conclusion on Mr. Ashcroft, and I've, I've, I've challenged you on this before. Yeah. Hopefully you have a better answer this time. But yeah. um, you say, speaking for myself, the friendship has been rewarded. May, may I interject? Of course it's been rewarding. You have made, and it's your professional fees. I don't grudge you your fees. But what you seem to be doing is turning a transactional relationship into virtue. Man, no man. No, no. I have a professional relationship. Of course. And, as I've taken pains to describe, a personal relationship. Obviously, I am biased. I have already said I consider him a friend, and I am not in the habit of speaking ill of my friends, whether they do bad or not. Um, I, when I say that I am of the view that it is quite likely that his involvement will in the long term yield be beneficial to Belize, I mean it. I may be biased. I might not understand economics and finance as well as you do. I'm just a lawyer. But I speak of his investments on the ground in Belize, which you can't pick up and take with you. Good. Yeah, we have a different view, and that's an argument for another time. Um, because, you know, I, I, um, I have a, a different view of how those investments work, but it's yeah. not about me. Um, if, I could, if I could ask you in general, though, um, you reach a conclusion that Mr. Ashcroft, or you seem to reach, as to his legacy in Belize, opinion will be, has been, but you believe it has been more beneficial than harmful. Mm -hmm. My sense is that Mr. Ashcroft is now entering 
uh, his third or fourth wave against the government. So he was against Esquivel, right. couldn't have his way. Then he went against uh, Musa and Fonseca, couldn't have his way. Yeah. Then he went against the Borough administration. That was a nationalization, but really was about the accommodation agreement. Yes. Now, it's a fourth wave, I believe, the is fourth. starting. Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Right. So the fourth, there wave, is a fourth wave is on the way. Yes. Are we not able to conclude, sir, that with all the tens of millions that have been spent and the hundreds of millions that have been paid in, in uh, compensation, etc., that Belize's relationship with Mr. Ashcroft, due in no small part to the venality of politicians, I'm very glad you said that, has been, uh, let us be kind and say, asymmetrical. We have, have benefited far less than he has gained. We have become, please forgive the terrible language, my viewers forgive me, we have become his, um, his jukebox, not jukebox. Yes. Ju you mean jukebox, yes. No. I... Music playing. You no, sir. It. I mean jukebox. <laughs> yes. Because you just so... come and as you see me, you take it. Yeah. And I'm sorry for that language. Yes. And I don't support that, but I'm saying this is this is the consideration. We are just uh, like, we just lay down and take it. But isn't that also, um, Jules, symptomatic of the way the situations are managed by politicians? Take the, the BTL issue that raged, litigation raged for, what, six, seven years? 2009 to 2017, yeah. And what happened ultimately? Wasn't it settled out of court? Right, at a great cost. At a great, and with many millions churned up in between. So a lot of it has to do with management as well. And a lot of it has to do with all problems that just have not been properly resolved and tied off that linger over many years so he plays the long game the man is a chinese strategist they play the long game revenge is best served cool so he w will not take offense he will not get emotional he will plan methodically over 10 years if necessary to succeed in the end as I said, you invite an ultra-capitalist into your territory, you invite an international businessman into your territory, he will operate as an ultra-capitalist does. And he will be facilitated by various politicians and deal-makers. Across political divide. That essentially is the problem. If that wasn't the case, we wouldn't be where we are today. So then, what we clearly need is greater regulation. Yes. Mr. Ashcroft was made, I believe it was a permitted person, secretly by George Price mm -hmm. in 1993, eight days before the election. Was it really by George Price? He signed the letter. I mean, I have to, I, I'm his biographer. I'm not sure he think, was fully conscious of- Do you think of, Mr. Fonseca was a moving hand behind well, the I'm, permitted person letter? I'm not sure because 93 was before me. Yes. But the Price, I know if he was fully conscious, right. perhaps would have asked questions. I suspect it was put in front of him to sign. So then the accommodation agreement yeah. was signed in secret also by Mr. Musa. Yes. You were in government then, you didn't know about it. I think uh, I came to know about it after the problems right. started and the crisis emerged. So the consistent issue here is yeah. lack of transparency. Yes, 100%. The settlement deed that Mr. Barrow signed in Miami again yes. was done. It was a secret negotiation. Yes. There was no one else in that room. The agreement was not pre-approved. Yeah. These, as you rightly say, that needs to stop. There has to be transparency. Good. We take our final commercial break. When we come back, we'll talk about God. What is Godfrey Smith's problem with God? It's the first three letters in his, in, in his name. <laughs> but if you read these collection of essays, the man looked like he have a problem with those first three letters. We'll ask him about it when we come back after a final commercial break. Please stay tuned to Uncut. Run them jewels fast. Run them, run them jewels fast. Run them, 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 run them
Welcome back to Uncut, and we'll want to jump right back into the last part of our conversation, and we want to make this quick. But the main thing we have to talk about, they might, for me, the most gratifying portion of the book, is the criticisms of the judiciary, because we share a healthy dislike for the legal profession, and also for the practice and the effrontery of how the, uh, how the judiciary conducts itself in public. Mm -hmm. That is fine and well for me. I'm just a jackass. You, sir, are an attorney, you're a senior counselor, you're a senior practitioner, but you want to have it always. You want to have it always. You want to, to, to continue to, to, to benefit, to profit as a professional mm. of this practice, but at the same time, show naked contempt and disdain for it. Well, for the absurdities of it. So <coughs> let's be precise about it. Law serves an important function in society. It, it, it is not my passion. Um, I, I think it's only your profession. It's my profession. Okay. To a large extent, it's artificial. I do not feel that it serves fundamental, it, it builds humanity in the way, say, medicine does, or even engineering does, or teaching does. Um, I mean, many times you're caught in academic dissection of a word here and there. It really is artificial. So it's not my thing, let me say that. Um, but it's, it serves an important purpose. It's not so much contempt for the utility of the law as to the many absurdities that attend it. For instance, it is the only profession. I mean, you have doctors, accountants, engineers, all, all kinds, but we're the only ones who dress up in these robes and dark suits with this tropical sun bearing down on us, parading through the, the streets with the school children gathered, gawking instead of laughing at the absurdity of us dressed in the white man's clothes and on, on a hot day. And they all the my lording and my ladying and bowing. I, it's really too much, isn't it? Instead of getting down to the business of simply <coughs> delivering judgments. Um, if we could read that rather delicious section um, about, about uh, we, you say in here, the rule of law has not really worked to protect our most vulnerable. The elite of a society can afford its protection, but it remains inaccessible and elusive to a majority. The law, judges, and courts are forbidding to ordinary people, you write. Yeah. Yet every year, this is, this is what you were saying, elaborate traditional ceremonies persist in former British colonies which search service, church services to mark the opening of the legal year. Brass band parades and chief justices proudly bedecked in the robes and full-bottomed horsehair wigs of the colonial masters, yeah. inspecting guards of honor in the hot tropical sun while school children are lined up to gaze at the awesome majesty in courts of the law. Yeah. What makes it difficult to consign these antediluvian traditions to the dustbin of colonial history is that lawyers across the Commonwealth shamelessly cling to them with a reverence that borders on religiosity. Yes, and I say that from experience, not only in Belize, but across the Caribbean. Attorneys cling to it. They love it. They love it. Judges love it. In Africa, many Commonwealth countries, the hot African sun, and these fellows are decked out in their big full bottom wigs and robes. And they believe that they're not a judge unless they're dressed that way. 
they're not a real judge. You're so, right. So, so I want to make it clear that it's the absurdities right. that I poke fun at. Yeah, and, you're not and, impeaching and the, the integrity reform. of the practitioners. No. But it does speak to a spiritual wasteland yeah. that we don't need all of that thing to yeah. make we feel on so special. Yes. I find it offensive. Yes, I mean, it's just another product you're offering, really. So, um... If yes. you write, if I can read your conclusion. Yes. Surely it is time, you write, to scrap the pump and make the circumstances better for people, to shred the dull, repetitive judicial speeches, refulgent with platitudes, and devise ways of making the interest rates of banks less oppressive, ensuring that the failure of small business does not result in indebtedness or life to the banks, that simple disputes between citizens are settled in simple ways, much as it is still done in certain indigenous communities. Yeah. What we see here is, yes, you may, they may say you're a dreamer, but what you see, what, what I see here is someone who has seen the law work for those who pay for it to work. But obviously you are at a clear disadvantage, a clear advantage if you have money in the legal system, whether on the civil side or on the criminal side. Are poor people able to get justice? Not to the degree that wealthy people can. Because there are, I mean, you could, you could be an indigent person, you go before a court, and a judge um, will see the justice of the case. But oftentimes, if it becomes technical, you need help <laughs> to interpret the law and to use the technicalities and so on. I mean, I see it all the time in the British Virgin Islands. May I say this? In the BVI, where I am an ad hoc judge, it's a very commercial place dealing with IBCs, international business and so on. And the best British barristers are flown in. The arguments are so advanced that I find myself agreeing with the first lawyer presenting and saying, it's clear I agree. The other responds, I switch because the arguments are so persuasive. And then the other side responds and I switch again. It's, the point is, this is a game of technicalities. And the winner oftentimes will be the person who can attract a team, an army, a battalion, a platoon of high-priced lawyers. But you write that for a majority of the world's poor and most vulnerable, the contribution of the rule of law to their well-being has been vanishingly small. For millions of people eking out an existence from the soil, the rule of law is of no practical relevance in their lives. Yes, and I think oftentimes we lose sight of the fact as lawyers that nobody cares about lawyers. They look at the judicial system as, to a large extent, inaccessible, unjust, and it doesn't work for them. If you, if, if you were to do a poll, I have never done one, but I've seen polls done in other parts of the Commonwealth where you ask about the law and how you feel about it, does it protect you? People don't feel that it works in their favor. You say that many people mistrust the legal system and consider it an expensive game for the rich. Yes. Why does it continue, you ask, to be so venerated and unchangeable, especially in underdeveloped countries? That's a serious statement, that the legal system is an expensive game for the rich. So, so then, Mr. Smith, justice is bought? <sighs> no, not in this sense. Because you, that, you have to I don't be... mean in a, I, I'm sorry, let me distance myself and say that I don't mean that judges are for sale. I'm not right. tackling that. Right. I'm saying, though, that if you want justice, you have to pay a good attorney. To a large extent, yes, especially in complex cases. Otherwise, the other person will have a good one and will find... It's an imperfect system. You have to understand, and viewers have to understand, that when they approach a lawyer for justice, when you go to court for justice, you're not getting some overarching justice that applies. It's justice according to the evidence and how good your lawyer is at putting together the evidence. You could have a winning case. But if your lawyer isn't as skilled as the other side's lawyer in putting together the evidence, you lose. Or if he botches it up, you lose. So yes, you're at a distinct and clear advantage 
if you're able to afford, as people say, high-priced lawyers. You write in here that when you were a judge, you abandoned a lot of the, the customs of the courtroom. I tried to. Because the customs of the courtroom say that, well, if you show being a shots, you can't go in a court. You, you have short sleeve shirt, you can't, or uh, an unsleeved shirt, yeah. you can't go in court. Yes. A lot, these, are, these are barriers the court creates to preserve its, its, its culture, that, the illusion that it is an exalted space, yeah. but it's also a way to discriminate against the poor. Yes, because in my experience uh, in, in, in the Eastern Caribbean, people would come to court, they're not aware of all the rules, they come miles from the villages, they reach there in a slippers or sandals, and they're barked at by police officers, hey, you can't come into court like this. And when, well, I mean, I'm not faulting the police officers, that's the culture that's been ingrained for a long time. So you have to intervene and say, but I mean, unless the person is half naked or a scandal, or her behavior or dress would really outrage any objective sense of public decency, you come to the halls of justice and it's open for everyone and the playing fields should be equal. My Lord, you do not, when you were a judge, you, you discouraged the <laughs> malording. <laughs> yes. Explain to me, because we have many judges yeah. who insist on it. Yes. I must say that, to the best of my re recollection, the outgoing Chief Justice, Michel Lerana, had passed an order saying that you no longer needed to say my lord and my lady, and it was judge or justice so-and-so. Um, but it's so deeply ingrained okay. that notwithstanding that, I think it will take years before it stops because people are just used to the malording. And some judges insist on it and some lawyers insist on it. Do you believe that the justice system is out of touch with the reality of poor people? You have done a, a study on the magistrate's court in Belize. Mm -hmm. And what that, what that impact justice study fung, found out is a system at the lower courts that's completely neglected. And, you know, you just handle people how you want. They're not delivering a product. Yeah, the, the, the idea is to deliver justice is a product like any other. You're dealing with an imperfect system. And the idea is to deliver that product as efficiently, fairly, and impartially as possible. But the answer to your question is yes. The, it's an exalted profession. It's an elite system. And those who are the elite benefit and those who are not will fall by the wayside, by and large. They're crowded out. Yeah. When you were Attorney General, you came up with a, the Purple Book. I remember it well. Yes. You had a fancy launch, right? At you, the bar with As the I bar. recall, a part of it was to hire the great Julius Espat to fix up the, the courts. Yes. I, I hope that... Yes, yes. Not on the roof name in the league. <laughs> hey, well, I'm not about Julius, I'm on touches. <laughs> but um, but uh, I, I, I will leave that. But, but my question is... You failed at reforming the justice system when you were Attorney General. Let's put it a different way. I put some fundamental building blocks, which has not been reversed. And by that, I mean, when I came into office, judges from the highest to the lowest were on contracts. Now, when you go on the bench, you have tenure meaning you're there unless you... It's important in terms Mr. of... Smith, but look at our, our, the judiciary today, 20 years later. We have so many judges who I believe were on contract. Maybe it was from the Commonwealth. Maybe it was from the Commonwealth. Yes. It yes. was a term judgment. It, w it was a temporary. That, that was a, supposed to be a temporary. But many of them want renewals of their contract. That's an aberration from, from 2000 for the next 20 years. The large majority of judges who came on the bench had security of tenure. And I think that was a fundamental cultural change. But I'm not trying to 
blow up the, the, the achievement more than it is. It was a fundamental building block. But yes, essentially, tremendous work to be done. But you learn a lot. It's not easy. When you were Attorney General, you, I, I believe you were earnestly trying, but it's hard to institute change in a sclerotic, monolithic, and often moribund system. Well, I found it was easier to do bad things than to do good things. Far easier. You got resistance for reform and change. People didn't want that. It was easier to just go with the flow, fall in with the pack, and uh, fall in with the pack and do the things you're not supposed to do. Do you think you would ever return to politics? No. You're sure? Not party politics, not, not running. I'm interested, the only P I'm interested in is policy. And I'm happy in any way I can contribute to the policy of any government to help them in that way. Let us switch to our last subject, and this is our very last. We want to talk about God, the first three letters in your name, and also the subject of one of the essays, the God Conversations. Yeah. Sir, you seem to have a problem with the entire, uh, I don't know how to quintessentialize your problem because you should have rationalized these things long ago. But you still seem to be struggling, first of all, with the, with the you know, there's a line that says, the truth is not the same without the lies they make up. Mm -hmm. You still seem to be struggling with some of the, the stories in the Bible, some of the, of the narrative presented in the Bible. Well... It's not so you are an altar boy. I was an altar boy. You grew up beside a whole redeemer church. Indeed, I was an altar boy. Raised as a good Catholic. Oh, for many boys. That's correct. Um, and yes, Jesuit trained. Um, I'm not so sure it's struggling intellectually as opposed <laughs> to exposing, I think, again, some absurdities that attend religion and the notion of God. What are your principal problems with the entire construct? Well, for one, I think a case can be made that God, if he didn't rape Mary... Wow, wow! At a minimum... Shots fired, shots fired! Uh -huh. At a minimum, can be accused of having sex with her under duress. You're talking about the conception of Christ. Well, obviously. Um, you realize that there are religious people, Louis Wade and Pastor Serma right now, lighting torches against you. Well, I'm not sure what they're doing, but, but you are entitled to your interpretations. Right. But the reason why I say this, consider that Mary is a village girl from Palestine 2,000 years ago no education, perhaps barely an adult, because marriages occurred at young ages at that time, betrothed to Joseph, a humble man, an angel from heaven, Michael or Gabriel, I can't Gabriel. remember which. The angel Gabriel. A supernatural being appears before a humble village young woman can you imagine the impact of that and says to her you are to bear the son of god can she consent to that in the in the face of a supernatural emissary so at minimum duress and then he sends god his alter ego the holy spirit invisible of course to do the deed and puts poor Joseph in a bad light. As you can imagine in those days, your wife becomes pregnant, not married. It's not by you, that's a huge problem. He resisted, and according to the scriptures, angels appeared to him too and said, no, take, take her into your house. So he had to live with the embarrassment of having his betrothed impregnated by God 
perhaps against her wishes and his, live with it. But then she remained ever virgin. So what was in it for him? Absolutely nothing. I mean, I find it quite despicable, I'd say. And um, like in terms of you mean you think it's it's a terrible thing to do to these two humble people, right? Pick on some other woman, some more mature woman, uh, unmarried, etc., single, divorced, whatever the case may be. So, if I can, I can muster my best Christian response. You are trying to interpret in in temporal, secular, even logic the greatest sacred event in the world's history, our Western world's history. Yeah. This is a sacred event, but you are applying the, the logic. But what else can I apply? I don't have any supernatural skills. No Gabriel or Archangel has appeared to me to explain how it really happened. I can only go by what the scripture says and apply the gifts that God has given me to interpret and understand. The next problem I have is with, with Lucifer and, what, and God sending Lucifer to earth. If I may quickly just Let's make, read make about reference good to it. Lucifer. I, I, um, I don't have any highlights on this section because well, I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to be punished. Yes. <laughs> so, so I say, and this is in a debate with... with um, with religious people and pastors. I complained bitterly about God's casting Satan down to earth. How grossly unfair. Why cast Lucifer, a resourceful and powerful angel, the doyen of evil, down to earth among puny humans to wreak his havoc? It explains why mankind became so sinful. We didn't stand a chance from the moment Lucifer, masquerading as a serpent in the Garden of Eden, tempted our forebears, Adam and Eve, to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, causing them to see their nakedness. We became a sinful species, obsessed with the forbidden fruit. Why all humans thereafter pay the price at birth for Adam and Eve's fooling around in Eden by being saddled with original sin makes no sense, except to create a captive market of sinners requiring redemption and salvation. To compound the illog illogicality, God, charitable soul that he is, felt obliged to send his son to cleanse humanity's sins that he had engendered by casting Lucifer down to earth. To then require as a precondition for salvation that we accept his son as our savior struck me as a bit much. We might never have needed Jesus if Lucifer had not been cast to earth to introduce mankind to sin. Fond, of, fond as he is of sending angels to earth as messengers, one could be forgiven for thinking that after making the patently bad decision of casting down among us the mightiest angel gone rogue, good sense would have dictated that he send Michael the Arch Archangel in hot pursuit or some such angelic worthy to balance things off. If all Lucifer had to be cast out of heaven because he was sowing dissent and rebellion among the angels, it is blindingly obvious. He and his cohorts should not have been sent here. A monumental, everlasting error of judgment. Earth became, like Australia to Britain, a dumping ground for the criminals from heaven. Sir, how can you accuse God of an error? What you're saying is there that God had an error of judgment. You are applying human logic to divine. But what kind of to divine? What, what other? To, to divine wisdom. <laughs> well, this have... is not only 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 a blasphemy. It makes no sense, sir. You are questioning divine wisdom with your human limited logic. Well, because I haven't been exposed to divine wisdom as others have, perhaps if some sign could be sent, I, I might be able to understand. So I'm only dealing with the situation with the natural and limited gifts that God has bestowed upon me. Sir, uh, you, you know that we are in a, a very uh, a Christian conventional society, or we pretend to be, 
because you know that um, that sin actually pervades public and private life in yes. this town. But um, you know, why why did you feel it important to include an essay that uh, that really uh, questions God? It's not so much that I felt it important, but isn't it part of public discourse? I mean, this is a free society. We're supposed to be tolerant. We're supposed to listen to other views, freely disagree with each other. But there is no need for, you know, any sort of violent uh, disagreement or judgment. Uh, you know, it's, it's just one man's view. Sir, you are mixing up the intellectual and the spiritual. But I will leave you to God, my brother. Yeah. Um, with that, we conclude our show. Finally, we want to ask you, everybody they ask me, what part could buy this book? Break the bad news to them. Yes, the bad news is... You have the graphic, Mr. Denver, uh, for those who want a book. Go ahead. The bad news is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, the pressure on Angelus Press to deliver before Christmas to meet Christmas gift demands was tremendous. They printed 250 or 300 copies with the rest to come on the 30th of December, but all of that was sold out like in two days. So if I want and a copy right now? You cannot get a physical copy right now. Sold out before you launch. Until, uh -huh. uh, uh, well, actually, that's what happened. I was a bit embarrassed at the launch last night because there had been a run at the Angelus Press, so there were limited copies available at the launch. Um, but there will be available. Um, there will be you available. You can bring up the number right there. Yes, I think there was a it's number over there, there. On that screen. Right, 622-7819 to secure copies. They should be available by December 30th, which isn't very far off. Uh, E-Kindle versions, I think, will be on the 15th of January. How much is it for a copy, sir? Only 50 Belize dollars. And do you expect that it will outsell your best-selling previous book? And we can show the books, guys? I think... Oh. Yes, I think so. I think it will. And, and your best-seller prior to this was Price or Assassination? I think Assassination um, has outstripped them all. Okay, the Assassination, yeah. that would be the red book, the Assassination of Maurice Bishop. Yes. Um, yeah. The 40th anniversary of the Grenadian Revolution right. coming up next year, 2023. And finally, what's your next project? You've written on the great statesman of the Caribbean, that, that great patriarchy that has worked so well for this region. When writing about all those statesmen has to make you realize that we are really in a, a, a patriarchal <laughs> peace house. Well... I thought that I had selected as my subject matters genuinely transformational leaders like Price, Manley, and, and, and Maurice Bishop. The only other person I at this time have an interest in is Lyndon Forbes Burnham, of, of about whom nothing of any substance is written. Amazing. To my great surprise. Amazing. And I've gone in the archives in Guyana looking for material and there's it's really shockingly limited but not to be deterred i intend to use my time in guyana to see what uh, preparatory work i can do on revealing um, forbes burnham excellent we look forward to that thanks so much to mr smith for joining us um i don't think he's doing a lot of interviews but you can see why because we took two hours i thank so i thank you our viewers for, uh, for tuning in and for joining us tonight on Uncut. And uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas and join us back here in the new year when we'll have more shows. And Mr. Smith has told you how to get his book. You have to call that number 622-7819. Thanks to all our sponsors. And again, um, join us back here in 2023 when Uncut will continue. Good night. God bless. Run them jewels fast, run them, run them jewels fast, run them, 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 run them